score so we can mount it against the registration. It would be great. And as we're waiting, how about everybody put into the chat where you're coming in from today? And then I think Rhonda has a question, or hand raised. Rhonda, do you have a question? Okay, we'll just give it a few more minutes. Again, please make sure that your name is associated with the one that you RSVP'd with, and we will get started in just a second. If you're just now joining, please drop in the chat um, what area you're tuning in from. Hi, Lena. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Hanging in there. Super excited. I noticed a bunch of the names that have called in today. We've got a really awesome group. We're going to give it one more minute. Looks like we've got everybody in here. So I wanna welcome everybody tonight. We are in part three of our three part series, the College Success Roadmap. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce y'all to Mark Dunlop, the Survivor Outreach Services Financial Counselor um, that I wanna say taught me everything I know that uh, to do with college scholarships, education, um, pathways and everything to do with that realm. He has a wealth of knowledge. So we are excited to welcome him and get to pick his brain a little bit tonight. So we will turn it over to him to do his presentation. And uh, if you've got questions for him, please put them in the chat and we will review them at the end. Thank you. Today, we're going to be looking at demystifying the college scholarship process. And when I talk about this, I, I basically say we'll be looking at a lot of financial consideration for military survivors and others. Allow me to clarify. Oh, sure, we'll be talking about the VA educational benefits for the children, for the spouses. But I recognize some of the names on this call, so I deliberately want to make an aside. We'll talk about some general scholarship issues like the FASPA, filling out the FASPA, the new one, the Pell Grant, which comes from it, and some of the resources that are out there, not necessarily military. I know that right now on this phone call, we have some people that are curious about benefits for siblings of those that um, were affiliated with the military. Fully aware, we don't have some of the traditional military scholarships, but some of these concepts, I hope, will work and, and, and help. Today, today's program, by the way, if you are a, a, a peer looking for AFCCE, because the presentation is doing two things. One, it's educating participants. And two, it is also for some of my peers, it does come with 1.5 pre-approved CE, which is nice uh, for that. And your code is right there on the slide deck. The objective of today's workshop is going to be several fold. Yes, I'm going to close. The last part will be on the FAFSA. Um, and then a couple of practical tips about going to college. We'll talk about the Pell Grant and the changes to the Iraq-Afghanistan Service Grant. 
But the whole concept of this dialogue is going to be on perfecting your scholarship search process, aligning your time in school with financial opportunities and creating financial realistic budgets. My goal is to encourage you not to have to take out loans. Even people say interest-free loans are good play money. You know what? If you can avoid the loan, I feel that I've accomplished something. You won't need it then we because you're going to capitalize on a lot of scholarships. So test me on that. We're going to try to do it so you can go to school and graduate debt-free. Sets you out for success going forward. So this is going to be a financial work workshop in many aspects. One of the key things is you will have my contact number. I'm employed by the Department of Defense Survivor Outreach Program. You are welcome to, to give me a phone call after the presentation, pop me an email, and I'll do my best to boutique things for you. Just like many groups are willing to do that for you, and I can put you in touch with some of those groups as well. But gosh, I'd love to have a shot at it as well. So that's some of the things we'll be looking at. The first thing I want to remind people is please do your FAFSA. We'll talk more about it later, but basically you're going to be doing a FAFSA now if you plan to be in school this current term or the spring term or the summer term. If you plan to be in school next fall, basically you'll do the FAFSA. Now, the official website says it's been delayed about three months. Instead of October 1, it could be as late as January 5th, just to brace you. We'll talk about that. But you want to periodically check late December and, and see if it's up and get in there. And we'll talk about why I'd like your FAFSA done as close to the gate opening as possible. There just is a delay for this because of all the changes that we'll talk about. Many of our surviving students um, have opportunity for the Fry Scholarship. We'll talk about that. Some have both the Fry and the DEA. The DEA is, is if it's service-connected, a VA benefit. You usually get both if the death was prior to 8-2011. Now, what's also interesting is I've had a few situations where the fry was denied for one reason or other, but the student still could collect some DEA. So we'll talk about that. The biggest question that I often get is how many months is the fry? Well, you know what? Normally it's 36. But with the fry benefit, in some cases, if you're in the middle of a term and you ran out, they'll let you wrap up the term and still pay. Also, now with, with STEM programs, that can extend the fry as well. We'll talk about that in more depth in a little bit. But the forever bill has done something very powerful. For those children who became eligible, now what does eligible mean we'll cover, after 1-1-2013, technically, just like this for the spouses, the forever bill means you can use your 36 months whenever you want. I have a military surviving person um, that uh, said, oh, I, I missed it. And I can't use it. And I said false. In many cases, the Fry benefit doesn't have a delimination date. Yes, in some cases, it's 33 for a child. But other cases, it does not. So it opens the door. We'll spend a little time uh, also talking about Folds of Honor, Children of Fallen Patriots, Freedom Alliance, No Greater Sacrifice, MOA, Fisher House, Thanks USA, American Legion, Folded Flag, Veterans United, Special Forces, Gold Star Peak, and there's a whole plethora of that. I'm not one to say, here's a list, try it. I feel whoever you work with, be it's a representative from a 51C3 group, um, one of your SOS coordinators, someone from Tuesday's Children, someone from TAPS, whoever you work with, allow them to work with you to boutique applying for things that apply to you. Anyone can give you a list of 600 scholarships and say, go fend for yourself. The, the true mark of, a, and many of the groups that I mentioned really follow that model is handhold you, pick some, and maybe even guide you as you apply. Once you have a template to apply for one or two, you'll be in good shape. And I don't hesitate to ask for scholarships from the colleges themselves as well as from the state. And that's why I want you to get your FAFSA done early for those state grants. Oh, by the way, some of the states have their own form, just like Florida does. Now, VA benefits. There, I tell people, know the VA benefit hotline, different than the, the traditional VA benefit hotline. They close at 6 Eastern. And if you have a follow-up question, just realize your claim for VA benefits is going to be processed in one of the two uh, processing centers. And you see that on your sheet, Buffalo and Oklahoma. That's good to know, especially if you're asking for clarification on a decision that had come your way. Now, as promised, 
let's talk about popular VA programs. Children eligible for DA and Fry due to a death prior to August 1, 2011, and I mentioned it, can potentially, potentially have both benefits. Now, the DA probably expires at mm, 26, the Fry longer. So I encourage you, if you're going to get both, to strategically look at that. Also realize when you start using a VA educational benefit, you're forfeiting your DIC. Now, granted, the DIC benefit might only be in the $300 range, but time things out. I have some people plan 10 years of college. They're going to be doctors. They're going to be uh, specialists, attorneys. So watch how you use the benefits. You don't have to run in for the easy low-lying fruit and apply for the fry right away. You can you can apply for the fry. That doesn't mean you have to use it. it would be even more uh, for clarification. So you can put in an app for the fry. It doesn't mean you have to use it. If you're getting a lot of nonprofit groups and other things, you don't need it, and you're going to community college, have it ready just in case you need it. But use some of the other things that are available at your doorstep. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So you have that, that situation. The other thing is, and this is kind of a new interpretation from the VA, and we can talk offline if you fall in the category, but for debts after January 1, 2013, historically it was the death had to be prior to, uh, uh, I'm sorry, after January 1, 2013. That was the understanding. Reality is the eligibility is, it can be trumped if the student was not yet 18 at the time. Now, on a case-by-case -case basis, if, if you are being told, hey, 33, you've got to use it by 33, and you have an award letter that says, got to use it by 33, may I recommend call the VA hotline number, see if they can verify that you fall into that situation, or if, in essence, you have it more uh, for a longer period of time, like lifetime, to use those 36 months. The interpretation has been very fluid and actually very positive, so stay tuned for that. So you have that situation of what does it mean for deaths uh, prior to January 23, uh, 13, but more importantly, what about for children that weren't yet 18 at the time? More on that later. Also, I don't run into this too often, but I do see some households, last bullet as I'm talking about, where the service member uh, transferred before the death some VA educational benefits. Might have done nine months to one child and nine months to another child, nine months to another child, and hmm, maybe nine months kept themselves. So I always say, if there was not a Montgomery GI Bill refund done at the time of death, you might want to inquire if you're eligible to use what was transferred to you. Maybe not, and most cases not. I don't want to give you false hope. And if the service member kept some of the months to themselves, it is sometimes possible to request those months because they're not going to be used. And if internally there's some of the children want to, to share some, that's something that you want to speak to the VA of. But again, that's only if, you, if it was not a Montgomery GI Bill refund and the Montgomery GI Bill was funded and given to some of the students. Not too common. I wish it was. So you have uh, possibly some options that are available to you. Now, one thing that I really want to say that is outstanding is the Yellow Ribbon Program. It has different names. You can click on it. I gave you a link. You're going to get these slides uh, and look at it. But understand that I had a student at him who was going to a school and the tuition was quite high. And even with all the other grants they were given, it was still quite high. And what they did to the, with the school, they, they said, OK, I have a shortfall of six thousand dollars. And the school said, you know, you're right. And we are VA Yellow Ribbon participating. And you're asking us early enough we can consider having you in our arsenal. So notice I said two things. The school has to be participating. And two, they won't do it necessarily for all the students. They might have limited funds because in essence, that $6,000 is being split. 50% by the VA and 50% by the school. So the school has limited funds. So if you think you're going to be asking for VA pricing to help you for the excess beyond what the Fry benefit covers, which is in the 27,000 range, but if you think you're going to be needing that, that's absolutely fine, but let your school know in advance, like even now for next year, that's, hey, you know, I'm planning on this. So they have it, uh, they have and know that it's coming. Now, I want to take a little aside on the DEA because I recognize some of the names on this conference call. And I know some people will be listening to this on the, on the, um, the, the playback. 
the DEA. The DEA benefit, I always say, ask. I have had for some people who turned 18 years old on or after August 1st, 2023, um, that um, in some cases, well, the death occurred after 2023. In some cases, um, we are now getting some of the new letters out because of the um, death. We're getting the, the DEA not to cut off at 26. So that's always a good question. VA is the final authority. Always ask them. Uh, when does the DEA expire? In some cases, we are finding that it's, especially in the newer deaths, that just coming right out of the, the, the situation is they're not having the cutoff. And that's new. You can go to the DEA website to get clarification of that, uh, the VA DEA website. But August 1, 2023 is, is new and significant. You can get the wording there. Uh, so take a peek for that. Um, there is some 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 good opportunities with the DEA. And again, I emphasize, try to log into your account. What? Yes. There's something called a DS login, and there are other ways to log in. Go into your VA account. If you've applied for VA educational benefits, or even if you're getting DIC for a while, it's nice to know when it was paid, what how much is left uh, for like the education. Log in. Everyone when they're 18, I suggest, has their own DS login to get into the VA. By the way, it's handy too, because with that, you can get into programs like um, TRICARE, the dental plan, TRICARE Medical, TRICARE Dental, and even update DEERS. So that's an important, important thing to know. Now, as an aside, I mentioned the dental and the vision, since I have many children on the line, as well as uh, spouses. As a reminder, if you're not in the vision plan, open enrollment begins the second Monday in November for four weeks. You would go to Benny Feds to check on that. That's just your comfortable aside. Now, I do want to share that we sometimes, uh, people are asked for more information on the fry. I gave you two links to look at it. Uh, that kind of makes sense. Um, some, some of the smaller schools still say, uh, I'm not sure about this. Um, the, and they look up the vanilla 33, not the fry version of the 33. So uh, print them that postcard uh, for some of the things out there and to get a little clarification if need be. And remember, the VA is, is going to be your guide and your authority. Now, people have asked me about nonprofit organizations. Again, if, if you wanted me to rattle off, I could probably go over in, in the hundreds. But I like to people to focus on a few at a time. I pick some. That regularly, I know a lot of students have said have they found favor with Children of Fallen Patriot Foundation. One reason that I, I selected them here, I'm not favoring, but I'm saying one thing I like about them is they have rolling opportunity to apply. You can apply now for the current term. That's called rolling opportunity. So they have been great. And I like people to get on their radar, even when they're 16 years old, even earlier. But I'll tell you why I said 16. You apply for them. You say you're 16. And you're doing well, at least a 2.0 in school. The odds are they're going to give you a $500 grant for miscellaneous course to prepare for college. Wow, yes. And if you're doing a dual credit course, which is getting very popular, like with a community college, they'll give you up to $1,500 towards a laptop. This could be 16 years old, 17. The, so that's kind of a cool thing. The other thing is by being on their radar early, and I know they're planning to be at Snowball Express the first weekend of December, get on their radar. They like engaging with the students early on to coach them. They not only give out money, but they give practical coach. And many of these, the college scholarship administrators that they have in their staff, they've been there, done that. They're military survivors themselves. So I highlight that. Folds of Honor. Folds of Honor is, is, is a group, gosh, drinking my coffee. I, I even have their mug um, uh, with me. The Folds of Honor scholarship program is, is kind of an interesting concept. Their enrollment, you apply in February, in this case, February 2024, for the following year, that being fall, spring, and yes, summer 2025. Juniors sometimes are saying, what, am I applying for scholarships for when I graduate high school and maybe do some summer courses in those uh, opportunities in the summer? When I graduate high school in 2025, do I really apply in 2024? I say, yes. 
And do your FAFSA early too, because the FAFSA you'll be filling out by, you know, around January 5th, maybe December 22nd, who knows. The, you're filling it out, yes, not only for the following fall, sp spring, but yes, that's summer too. So you're doing this in advance. So Folds of Honor has that window. It's a two month window to apply. Um, and in essence, you're applying, if we say about the summer school, pretty far in advance. So I tell the, the juniors to be sensitive to that. Freedom Alliance is a group, oh, they love getting engaged with their students well in advance. It is not, I have people that are mid-teenagers already glued to them and have a relationship with them. Now, historically, they've had rolling applications. Right now, they become so popular, they're going to be taking applications again for the following year uh, in this first week of January. But that is an example of another rolling application program. The Folded Flat Foundation is a group that I use a lot with the survivors. Their enrollment window opens March, and it's open for 45 days if you still want to have assistance to go to the summer school um, that same year. A little different than what I described earlier. And they often will give you a living stipend. Now, this is important. When a school will give you a living stipend, um, that's not paid to the college. And it's to you, which means if you have so many scholarships, you go beyond what's needed, they're not looking for the living stipend to have it refunded. So that's an interesting concept. And then we have no greater sacrifice. They are amazing. Um, I work a lot with Rebecca. You'll see her on their website. Rebecca Levon, you know, what happens with them is they start working with students even as early as eighth and ninth grade. They, they start getting to know them, help them in career selection. So we have a plethora of really cool groups that are out there that I find very helpful. And earlier, the better, get on their radar. They don't even have an application, by the way. So basically, you would be contacting them, say, I potentially would be interested. Put me on your radar. I'm just want to tell you a little bit about my, myself. And when an application's ready, I'll fill it out. But you develop a relationship because that's what the type of entity they are. Now, a common question that I get is, what documents will I possibly need? If it's a service-connected death, you know, uh, active duty, you're going to get a DD-1300. If it's a if it's a VA disability um, letter, you will get a VA award letter. And there are some other letters that people are asking for. If you don't have a copy showing that you ever got a VA benefit, and you probably were, the DIC, maybe it was paid to your guardian, I tell the children, or or, or the surviving spouse, but somewhere there was a award letter with your name on it, I tell the students. You're going to need that for many of the scholarships. So find it. If you can't, have no fear. Call the VA benefit hotline number. Uh, if you're under 18, have the guardian do it. Um, and say, hey, I can't find anything that says I'm getting the VA DIC. I know I'm getting it. Can I have like documentation of that? While you're on the line, they'll send it to the to, to the person. Now, if they mail the original letter to your guardian or or a parent, surviving parent, have them on the line with you, but they'll even email you. They understand the necessity of having it for some of these nonprofit groups. The other thing is I want people to do um, the FAFSA. We'll talk more about that later, but uh, it, it's kind of nice to have that done early, which you will. But if you've not ever, ever done a FAFSA, I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to reiterate this a few times, make sure you can. You know, do you, Are you able to log in? Is your parent able to log in? Do that now. So come, you know, January 5th, or if they end up doing it as early as two weeks prior to that, whatever the day is, you're ready to go. And I do often say you may want to do what we call as a CSS profile. Speak to the college you're going to see if they welcome that information. Other documents you might want to start collecting. Birth certificates, marriage certificates, uh, uh, if you're a spouse, some schools will will want that. If you have an acceptance letter, and I know some students ready for next fall got their early decision acceptance letters uh, literally this month. Um, it's breathtaking. Um, or they got some of their, uh, some ready got traditional acceptance letters already for next August. Um, and then we're doing this phone call in October. Um, but, uh, you know, if you have them, have them handy, have them in the PDF so you can upload them. Also, most scholarship entities uh, will ask you for proof that you were a good student in your last term in school. So make sure you have that ready in your PDF to upload. Now, ACT and SAT. Remember last week uh, as part of the Tuesday's Children program, what a great program that was. I hope you have time to listen to the audio when it's sent to you. Um, 
it's optional for a lot of schools. The competitive ones still want it, but it's optional for a lot. But don't, 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 don't say I don't need to do the ACT or SAT. It's optional to get in. But if you want a scholarship from that school, they probably will want to see your ACT and SAT scores. So you want to work on that. So a little aside there. So other, other entities, um, nonprofit groups will ask for things, have people at your arsenal. Some will ask to have an essay letter. Uh, you can modify it as need be. Some of them are very similar. Have that out there and um, perhaps check with the school you're looking for. Do you want to have your CSS profile, as I mentioned earlier there? Now, the big question I get, and this was shared last time, is how often should I take the ACT or the SAT? Now, I'll tell you about my son, Jonathan. I know some of the people have heard it. Some have actually met him when he's come to conferences with me, but I'll use him as an example. Jonathan took both the ACT and the SAT. He did okay, actually okay plus on the SAT. He did very well on the ACT, enough to get him a decent scholarship to the school of his choice. I encouraged him to take the exam again and was able to find some prep software packages available to him. And if you need to, to, uh, to be, uh, I can tell you the secret sauce that we use if you want to tell me offline. And some of them are available at a moderate scholarship for our military survivor family. So that's good. He did it again. He got a score up and now his scholarship doubled. Cool. I was a little pushy. Jonathan, take it again, again, again. He ended up raising the score six points, but that six points enabled him to have a scholarship that even covered part of his master's. Wow. I'm glad that 17-year-old, actually 17, 18-year-old, and he actually did this one of the final tests just to get that score up. He was already accepted, already got a scholarship, but you get that bonus. He actually did the final SAT uh, or ACT in this case, you know, the week of his graduation. I was proud of him and it saved me a lot of money and, uh, and, and it worked out really good. And then, so I tell people, be aware. So that's some thoughts on the ACT. Now, there are other groups out there and it's tough to, when you do a list to mention some, because there's so many, I will tell you uh, many of the survivors that I work with are finding great favor working with the American Legion, especially for grad school. The Fisher House Foundation, it has some wonderful things out there. The Navy Relief Society, the Army Relief Society, MOA, the VFW. And let's not forget those that are special forces, what's available from special forces. Uh, great scholarships. And they actually do summer camps, usually in June, for some of their students on the college experience down at the University of Tampa. See, that's the type of service that I really appreciate from these nonprofit groups because they are really getting to know the student. They're not just giving money, they're caring for the student. Now, I did a workshop for Tuesday's Children. I'm glad to be invited back. Thank you for the privilege. And at the close of it, I had people put in whatever uh, the chat boxes and say, what scholarship programs and networking have you used that are not necessarily military scholarship things? I put the list for you, and when you get the out of uh, the printout, you'll see that list. You know, one was Scholarship Mom, one was Scholarships.com, one was Fast Web, uh, College Scholarships.org. Um, you see Big Future Scholarship. You see a whole arsenal that's out there. I'm not endorsing. I'm saying your peers mentioned this to me, and I checked the website still work. Now some are ad supported, so go go carefully. But you may find that to supplement some things. These are not .gov, .mil. And whenever I use a non.gov, .mil, I do say, just be careful. And be careful to differentiate between real scholarship offers and scholarship scams. If you listen to the last two segments of uh, that Tuesday's Children did, you had wonderful insight into the whole scholarship process. Really, it's an hour each one. Please listen to it. I, I, I I learned a lot on that, listening to it. And this, I've heard the speaker before. It is amazing. And also, by the way, he did a great job talking about the new SAT and ACT, where it's not going to be pencil paper for a lot of the students. It'll be on a computer, either leased to use at the facility or bring your own in some facilities, which is, I think, pretty cool. You know, use, use a machine that you're cozy with. But that whole format is changing. In fact, the, 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 the and you can hear the scholarship, you, what they're testing on may be focused in different threads of questions. If you do well, super well in the earlier ones, they can now take you to the next level and enable you possibly you know, in, in the sections to get a higher score. So there's a lot of things out there. 
But do look at, be careful when we're looking at some of the sites. You know, sometimes, you know, and I gave you a few that came from the survivors. You might not need them because if you're V, if you're getting VA benefits and that from military groups, but because we have a lot of siblings on, nieces, nephews, and just folks, including uh, some people that are not getting as many of the VA traditional scholarships, 9-11 survivors included, if you desire to go to them, just be careful the link you go to. Consider the website. If there's a spelling or grammar error, that could be a sin, sin, saying eh, something's wrong here. But you know what I found to be the best source? Working with the peers. I tell survivors, ask your peers. You know, hey, what if you found to be helpful? I know many moms at the PTA held me or PTA meetings, you know, in high school, just say, hey, what's help? What's working for you? Are there any things unique in the state? And hopefully they're good enough friends to share their secret source, some programs that are out there. And I say, take advantage of the programs. Tuesday's Children, TAP, Survivor Outreach Services, Navy Gold Star Program, and some of those 51C3s. You know, I, I, I admire some of the groups that I mentioned earlier. They are, when you sign up for their scholarship, they say, by the way, if we can't perfectly aid or we see an opportunity, would you mind if we share your name with one of the other groups we have a, a community partnership with? Wow. That's like, it's a wonderful life, like Macy's and Gimbel's. It's a great scenario there. Now, one thing I've noticed just because of, you know, being a financial planner, counselor, a CFP, what I've noticed is many families, when they fill out their taxes after they paid some bills, don't realize there are two potential tax breaks available for them. The American Opportunity Credit allows students or their parents an opportunity to reduce the cost of attending college by getting some qualifying educational expenses as a tax credit on the federal return. Wow. And then we have the Lifetime Learning Credit, very flexible out there. Um, so take a peek at the Lifetime Learning Credit as well. When you're doing your taxes, um, or whoever's helping you, be it Military One Source, which is available to military families. Uh, it's called MilTax, by the way. You look at those two things because some things that you didn't get a scholarship for, some of the nickel and dime things might be covered by a tax credit. So that's something to be very sensitive to that's out there. Now the topic that many people have been waiting for, FAFSA. Allow me to share about the FAFSA Simplification Act. It was enacted by law. Um, a few years ago, and the game plan was to do phased roll-ins. And it's done a lot of unique things. Not all the information's out and available uh, for this coming year, and that's okay. But what has come out thus far is, in general, pretty good. Now, as in the past, you got to fill out a fast, but you get potentially a Pell Grant, which is a subsidy. As in the past, you also have to fill out a FAFSA to get any, although it's not as popular, it's really for the lower income segment, which people may be qualifying for, uh, to get a, a federal supplement educational opportunity grant. So you got to fill out the FAFSA. And as mentioned earlier, the earlier out of the gate, the better. So you have some, some of that. And I have people saying, I, I say, are you getting the Iraq Afghanistan service grant, which in essence is the Max Pell grant. If you're not getting the Max Pell grant, which is now $7,385 for the year. If you're not getting the Max Pell Grant and your soldier or service member passed away in Iraq, Afghanistan, or related to Iraq, Afghanistan, and it's noted as such, they're, they're, if they're on the data match currently, next year it's going to be by self-disclosure, then you get automatically the Max Pell Grant if the school sees the data match flag. And that's been an issue. But we help them see where it is. Or if it's self-identified and it indeed is viewed as one of the service members that indeed their death was theater death, Afghanistan, Iraq. In essence, they now get the Max Pell, which means if you get a partial FAFSA, a partial Pell, pardon me, partial Pell, you get the Max Pell. If you're getting nothing, you get the Max Pell. So that's how it pretty much works. Now, let me go through some things about the new FAFSA form. First of all, you can go online and pick about 20 colleges. Remember two weeks ago on the conference call, we said, hey, with the competitive nature of the colleges, even for the mid-tier colleges, you're not sure you're going to get in. So you want to apply for several. Go to your top tier, middle tier, and, and just have some backup plans. So send them all to school. I also say send it also to a local community college because you might be going to the community college with some part-time classes, maybe during the summer when you graduate high school. And remember, 
So this is good. You can get up to 50 different colleges that can be listed on the FAFSA. The other thing is I want people to be aware of what's going on. We're going to be using an SAI as our, as, as to calculate things, not the expected family contribution. What is an SAI? An SAI is just a way to figure out what scholarships you get. But we start off instead of zero, we start at negative 1500, which means there's more that's going to be available for the lower income people uh, potentially to slip in and get something. So that's good news. Uh -huh. Good news. Yep. So basically what we're looking at is some enrichment things that I think are very good. Let's do yay or nay. Thumbs up on this one. Eliminating, uh, well, actually thumbs down on this one. It's eliminating the discount students receive when they have siblings enrolled in college. That's a concern. So if you had several siblings at the same time in college, you got bonus points, making it uh, you know more affordable, more scholarships. You're not seeing that anymore. So I'll call that an ouch. Increasing the income cutoff used to automatically award the maximum Pell Grant. That's a positive. Increasing the amount of student parental income that is exempted in determining financial need. That's a positive. Reducing the parents' expected payments for students with low incomes. That's a positive. For 2024-25, the questions are being reduced from 108 questions all the way down to 36 questions. To me, that's a positive. And also, the fact is they'll be able to, in a simplified manner, upload the tax returns of the student as well as the parents. That's a positive. And as mentioned earlier, hey, you can just list 20 schools that you want to send the reports to easy. Um, that's a very big positive. Now, some things about the FAFSA simplification law that I'd like you in your free time to look at because these are be robust, fluid, and are being updated. It's called the Dear Colleague Letters. Now, it's meant for the school officials to look at, but you can look at it and see a couple of things that are very po popular out there, especially about programs like the Iraq-Afghanistan Service Grant. So it's really a cool thing. And I love the simplification question and answer section. So these links, I hope, will help. We tested them today. They're still hot and working, which is great. A lot of things about FAFSA simplification has already been put into place. More people could apply for it. But one of the key things that I find with the Simplification Act is the view on this word, professional judgment. Now the school administrator that can do professional judgment and adjust a Pell Award or other awards that come from higher ed because of special circumstances. It could be the death of, of a service member, although that's not clear in the code. It says disabled of the service member. But again, the code that the, the, the code that they're using to administer is evolving still, but there's a lot of potential flexibility that's there. And part of that judgment can be, I, I had a student the other day that uh, is independent, 18. Can't even, doesn't even know where his bio mom is. You know, at, at 18, left and has no idea. Technically, the mom has to do her portion for the for the for the for the uh, financial aid for it. He can't find her. I don't. Now we're not going to have a stalemate. The school saying, "I get it. It's fine. Professional judgment. You're independent." So the schools are going to be very key. Now I want to make a key dif differentiation. Your two new best friends to the students. One, the financial aid officer at the school. Two the VA lays on at the school and explain to the VA, if you're getting a lot of financial aid things, you might apply for the fry, but might save the fry for later on. Some things that are out there. Now, in summary, I just want to make sure we're using the right buzzwords. This year, we're still using expected family contribution. Starting for 2024-25 that you'll be applying for, they're saying the window's December 22 to the 5th of January, possibly around the, the 5th of January, which is kind of interesting because federal law says it can't be later than January 1. But whatever, whenever you get to do it, um, you're going to get, uh, the school's going to get information on what is the student aid index. That's the big buzzword. The other new buzzword is your FTI, the federal tax information it, that's going to be retrieved directly from the IRS. The most significant changes are going to, though, be on the needs analysis formula. Our lower income families, and many of our surviving families are the single wage earner families, for starters. Um, and in many cases, um, 
the surviving spouse did not yet go get back to the workforce because they're raising the, the, the family and the kids and they have other children at home. In some cases, they're going to see a better scholarship. Now, I have good news for you. For those that are in school now that see a reduction just because they had several children in school and now they're not going to get as much grant because of it, if you see a reduction, contact some of those 51C3 groups you're working with. They're aware of this. Uh, I've spoken to many of them in advance of this call. They're very sensitive to it. And what they will do is see if they can take that in account in the allotment and scholarship for you. This is powerful stuff. So those are some things on the Simplification Act. Now, reminders. Technically, if you want to wait to the very last minute, you know, for even 2023-24, you can do a fast one, June 30th, 2024, retro all the way back to the prior fall. But I don't recommend that. Why? Because I want you to get the state grants. I want you to get the scholarship grants that might be coming from the school. And also some of the 501c3 groups want to see that you applied on time. So don't wait for the last minute. On the contrary, as soon as the gate opens, please apply. Now, be careful. Like the state of Missouri, they're saying still, knowing that the federal FAFSA might not be available until you know, January 5th. They're saying they still want for priority because they're concerned they're going to run out of funds for the state scholarships for in-state people that are staying in state still to be done by January 30th. I know what a lot of people are going to be doing in January. Whoa, with that condensed window. And yes, I am personally concerned because I know historically by 15th of December, usually half the FAFSA applications have been in. And now we can't we don't even have the gate open then. So it's going to be a busy January for many families. Uh, I also say be sensitive to the state state deadlines, but get it in earlier because if the state runs out of funds, first come, first serve. So that's a key thing. And remember, when you're doing the fast, if you're doing it now for 2023-24, you're still using 2021 tax return. When you do it on January 5th, if I can use that date, you're doing 2022 tax return. So where do we go now? While we're waiting, while you're waiting, Please, if you potentially think you're going to be doing a FAFSA application, if you don't have a password to get in, try that. Uh, that's, a, that's a good step. And also bear in mind that there are other scholarships, not only the Pell Grant, it's the Federal Supplement Educational Opportunity Grant. Now, a lot of the surviving children that I work with just don't get it. Uh, the SBP is so large, and then there's part-time em employment. I, but some of them are getting like $100, $200. Hey, that's better than nothing. So you don't have to do any action for it. You might want to speak to the school to see if you apply. That actually is a good idea. But you're filling out the FAFSA, school gets the information, see what Pell you're getting and what federal supplement education you can get. You can actually ask the school on this topic. Hey, here's my situation. And if there's something unique, you can ask for professional judgment. So you have some of those th uh, those things. Let me summarize some of the changes you want to look at. You want to look at, yes, there's a little bit of delay to apply for the FAFSA for 2023, uh, for 24-25. A little bit. No big deal. Just be prepared. Do get a FSA ID. You can do that now. And it'll take about three days because they got to do a match with Social Security Administration for verification. Now, something that's relatively new. Um, I, I've had... And this won't impact, obviously, our active duty situation debts, but some of our service-connected debts that are on this call, uh, no, sorry, service-connected disabilities on the call, when there wasn't a debt, service-connected disabilities. Got to be very careful. This is newish. If you're filling out your FAFSA, and if your parents are divorced or separated, the parent who provided the most financial support in the last calendar year will now complete the FAFSA. It, the interpretation historically was, you know, hey, I, one parent did it one year, one parent did another year, and they, they flipped and flopped doing that. And that's how they figured out who, who has to do the FAFSA filing. Now it is whoever's getting the higher income. So be sensitive to that. Again, that comment does not apply to our casualty situations. It applies to our service-connected disability situations that are looking for financial scholarships, as well as some of the people looking for scholarships in general on the FAFSA that are siblings. Uh, be sensitive to that. So those are some of the key things. Other things that I find are, are really key is if you think that there's some unique information, you can request to view 
your FAFSA and obtain an unredacted copy of the ISIR, you would get that directly from the financial aid office at the school. So if you think, hey, I'm not getting anything, someone's picking up some funky numbers, you're entitled to that. Uh, so that's something just to be a, 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 a aware of. So those are some of the key things. I gave you detailed slides for going into some of the weeds and the minutia, but I'd like, uh, as as we're still on the FAFSA topic, to share some, some practical aspects. Deadlines I mentioned earlier. I cannot overemphasize state deadlines coming fast. States have limited funds. College deadlines, very important. You know, they're already sending out admission letters for fall 2024. And in some cases, they're already telling you what they're financially tentatively will give. Wow. When they run out of those endowed scholarships, and it could be in two or three months, they won't be for that current year for 2020. 425. So apply early and see what scholarships you can get directly from the school on top of the other grants. So those are some of the interesting things. Now, the Simplification Act, it's going to be reading your tax information. Historically, in the past, you had to add other income you're getting from other, other aspects. Basically, they're going to do an FA-DDX, which is going to be a download of the tax information. The rule of thumb of income, if it's on the tax form, they're going to know about it. That makes life a little easier. Significant change because untaxed income, including some needs analysis, housing, food, living expenses, pay to members of the military and clergy, in some cases, even the veteran non-educational benefits, it's other untaxed income, not on the tax return, doesn't get sent down into the form. So that's a, that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, the number of family members in college, hmm, that information won't be needed because they're not going to use that to adjust how much of the scholarship is going to be. Now, the FAFSA thing. I have found, especially in my role um, with the with the Department of Defense as a survivor outreach financial counselor, and my my background, um, I work with a lot of families, and they end up moving, selling things, you know, relocating. They're selling the family farm, you know, um, and you know it's a one time thing. So they look real wealthy on a tax return. I got news for you. By professional judgment, even though that's a one shot capital gain tax, the school can make, you got the word professional judgment. So that's something that's really powerful. They can adjust the assets. They can adjust the income to some degree or the output, the output that comes from the calculation. So there's a lot of flexibility. So that's all good news. So you have a lot of situations out there and additional flexibility for assisting students with unusual circumstances. Take advantage of that. Work with your financial aid thing. We covered a lot of the things of the changes in the Iraq and Afghanistan. It's going to be self-identification starting, starting for 24-25, which means you will find something that shows that, 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 that you're potentially eligible, show it to the school. Uh, so if there was a death that from Iraq, Afghanistan, the current year, uh, for the current year FAFSA, they're going to look for the data match, just like they have in the past years. Going forward, self-identification. It's going to be a new process. However, I have good news for you. We found a contact person that if the school is stumped on what this all means, now they can't validate that someone passed away in Iraq, Afghanistan, but if they stumped how to get the Pell Grant to be the max Pell Grant, got you a contact person in Chicago area, I mentioned that for time zone, who is willing to take questions from the schools if there is an issue. That's going to be quite helpful. You'll see that on the slideshow. Um, Megan, Megan is just a team player. Ironically, I worked with her when she was admissions and financial aid counselor at a college in Chicago years ago. So when I heard her name, I said, I knew someone who had that name. It was her. So it's kind of cool. Very good resource out there. With the Iraq Afghanistan grant, to clarify, you are going to now have an opportunity to get the Max Pell grant with no callbacks. So that's a very key concept that's out there. The Department of Higher Ed is the one funding the Pell Grant and other grants. That's going to be working with your financial aid office. VA will be working with the VA office. And again, I gave you a couple more of the letters and, and that have 
been uploaded public domain for clarification on the new um, Simplification Act. And yes, it is simplification. Now, the leadership at Tuesday's Children asked me a couple to spend a few minutes uh, talking about practical things, considerations, especially as a child goes off to college. And that was very insightful. And thank you. Thank you for doing that. First of all, if you're not using the VA educational benefit, might as well just use the v keep the VA DIC going by mailing in the annual, hey, I'm still in school. You can actually, until you turn 23, keep your DIC going. And by the way, if there's no eligible spouse, uh, the children can keep the SBP going until age 22. Just every year, mail in the right COE form to say, hey, I'm still in school. Um, that's kind of nice. Remember also TRICARE goes to age 21, but if you document that you're in school and send that information to DEERS, or actually bring it over, get an updated ID card, you can have your ID card ex extended all the way to age 23. Now there's legislation pending, actually it's in committees to extend that. But right now, 21, and if you're documented in school with the DEERS office, again, new ID card can go all the way up to 23. If you're documented, you'll still be in school then, which is powerful. Now, I have some people undergraduate that graduate 22, go to grad school 23. So you're going to get two updated ID cards, one to bring you to high school, uh, to college graduation, one to graduate school graduation. So TRICARE is out there. We also have TRICARE Young Adult that's available for a premium, about $300 for the select, about ooh, a little over $600 for the prime. And also, if you're staying in state in 41 of the 50 states, you may qualify for state Medicaid as an adult. And that's relatively new in many of the states. Now, practical things. I suggest to the survivors that I work with, to the children, if they don't mind, if you trust your guardian or your parent, like you did when you were, you had no choice, when you were under 18, why not give them the authority to inquire on your behalf with different agencies? VA is a good one there. Maybe even TRICARE, maybe TRICARE Dental. So that's something that's kind of your disclosure, your, your determination, to, I say to the children, something to look at. The other thing is, and I run into this as just a father, a civilian father, when my own children went away to college, um, you know, I, you know, we dropped off the stuff we wanted to bring there. We moved my child in, and then we went to the local pharmacy to make arrangements if he needed a drug prescription that uh, we could have easy delivery services, taking care of some of those practical things. And also, my children did sign a HIPAA authorization so I could get information about them on a medical plane from different entities. Uh, they appreciated that. So that's key. Now, I know many families, when a child goes to college, you know, they're 18, it's complimentary services from JAG. Uh, they get a will done for the child, for any assets, just in case something happens. You know, at least we don't have the extra aggra aggravation. And a healthcare proxy. You know, that's something that, you know, getting ready to college, it's a practical thing. It's also known as a healthcare power of attorney. I also tell parents, Where's your child going to be living? Oh, he got an off-dorm place. Two blocks from school, can walk there, take his bicycle. Great. Do you have homeowner's insurance for that place just in case something happens? Huh? Yeah. Look at that homeowner situation. And even if they're in the dorms, what, what happens if a laptop disappears? Uh, what happens if there's a fire in the dorm? Does your homeowner's coverage cover it? Does this, you know What happens there? It's fair questions to ask. Now, granted, especially if you're living off campus, you know, who is paying, you know, are you paying a little renter's insurance? It's usually not that expensive if something occurs. Something to look at when the child goes over to, to college. Now, I do often a workshop to encourage people to look at some practical things on wills and trusts and durable power of attorney and beneficiary designations. I'm giving you the bullets. These are topics that you may, if you have access to a JAG of the National Guard, the reserves or the Atta Garrison, to talk about wills and trusts, families, including adult children, need to revisit, I think, their own estate plan, but also have the children look at it. And then I tell, go to the parents, reevaluate your beneficiaries that you have, especially now that you have a child that's over 18. So there are some related documents, you know, durable power of attorney, you know, authorizes a named individual to act on behalf of a person for financial matters during one's lifetime, disappears when, when death occurs. Uh, power of attorney for healthcare, power of attorney for finances, advanced medical directive, 
also known as a living will. And in some states, beneficiary deed in New York, as well as Missouri, where I used to live in New York and here in Missouri, I can actually have a beneficiary deed, um, whereas the home will just go on the deed to the next in line without even having to go through probate. Every state's a little different, but these are some practical considerations family to look at as part of estate planning, especially now that their child's over 18. You know, how much do you now want to change, maybe even if you have a pension plan, contingent beneficiaries? Beneficiary designations are key. I tell people, especially now that your children are getting older, do you want to update your beneficiary designations on everything you have, including your loan life insurance? Related thoughts. Yes, children might update a will as early as 18. Uh, that's, okay. that's important. But I also remind the spouses, you might want to update your will as well. Now, I'll leave you with some final thoughts. The process of applying and maintaining a scholarship, it can be a full-time job, but it's worth the effort. Try to work with all the players from the scholarship liaisons to the email senders, to the scholarship departments, and the college officials. And be honest. If you have other funds coming in, tell them. Be honest, thorough, show courtesy, appreciation, timeliness, persistence during this whole process. It'll help you get to the scholarships that your family deserves. I said I would do the formal presentation um, in under an hour and we're there. But what I'd like to do, and my favorite part, is to field your questions. If someone wants to just read them to me and we'll see what we can do. Okay, Mark. So I'll start in the chat and I want to first say thank you. That was a ton of information and I always learn something new from you. Um, so first one, should a junior do the FAFSA even if not starting in the summer? Just in case they change their mind. They do. I look at my own own children. Uh, they weren't, they had it done. And uh, they ended up going there to knock out a chemistry class or a bio class in the summer because it makes scheduling later on a lot easier because those bio classes, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, go from not, if it's a regular term, from nine to 10, but on Wednesday, lab from 10 to 12, it would mess up a schedule. So some people knock out courses like that during the summer. I, when I went to school, did summer school at the last minute because they had two great offerings. Survey a Broadway plays. Every Tuesday evening, we went to see a Broadway play. I loved it. So it would happen. Um, it, you never know at the last minute. So just in case, do it. And the good news is, then the next year when you fill out the fast, you can flip over a lot of the information. It makes it a lot easier. So why not? So thank you for the question. Perfect. Um, if you want to use a yellow ribbon program, you mentioned to let the school know in advance. Is there a specific person or position or department at the school you should talk to? That's a great question. Remember, they're, they're, they're final, financial aid office for higher ed issues. And that will be the Iraq Afghanistan grant for the uh, supplement grant. And of course, for the Pell. Separate division will be the VA liaison. So uh, that's the person you would go to and say, hey, I see your tuition's a little more than normal. Uh, I am going to put in an application for the Fry or tell them it's already in. Um, doesn't mean you're going to use it, but let them know it's there. And then when they come up with a package, now, mind you, they may modify the package if they see other scholarships for tuition come rolling in. So um, that's why I love the groups um, that sometimes do living costs and um, for ancillary things. But you got to be honest with all the money you're getting because it could alter the yellow ribbon pricing because the VA is splitting it with the school. So you got to be very candid, everything coming in. But yes, tell them in advance. And in answer to the question specifically, uh, I would go straight to the VA liaison. Okay, thank you. And um, they said they tried to contact the VA hotline number several times, and they seem to always have issues with their phone system, uh, technical diff with technical difficulties. So it's difficult to get through. Is there another way to contact them? Ask, D, uh, ask VA, you can do that. But I will tell you, yes, I've heard that issue, but I'm using 888-442-4551 between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Central. Now notice through 6 p.m. Central, the regular VA benefit number goes to nine, uh, nine o'clock Eastern, eight o'clock Central. So you have two extra hours on the benefit hotline. So the VA educational is closing at six. 
So I've had people call in at 6.05, didn't get the right recording and just waiting, waiting, got disconnected. Yeah, they closed. So I'm not having the issues right now if I call within the hours that they're open. In fact, their hold times, and I've done three-way calls many times, and I make that offer, and I know many of my peer support coordinators would do that as well. We can do a three-way call. It, I am so comfortable right now that it's not over five-minute wait. Uh, and we can get that resolved. Also, to the students, I have a question. Log on to your VA account with your DS login. If you don't know how, ask your coordinator to help you. You know, that's how you go to Deers. That's how you go to TRICARE. That's how you go to the medical dental. So log in and you'll probably see the answer to some of your questions, like how many days, months do I have left? But yes, um, I, I give them a ring during the office hours. And if you have an issue, call me. We'll try it together. Perfect. Um, what if you didn't file taxes in 2021? Well, actually, if you didn't feel it was needed, then you're just kind of to do manual inputs. You know, now, if there was going to be a tax bill due, I would just file it now. Um, and you remember, I have some of my military surviving children that were getting SBP 2014 that are now being audited. Uh, yeah, it's like, whoa, because um, statute of limitations doesn't... Uh, doesn't apply. So I, if you didn't file and you think you owe taxes, yeah, now's a pretty good time to do it. Thank goodness you have the resources of some of the JAG uh, offices on the garrisons. You have military one source, you have the VITA volunteer tax centers. Yeah, I would file it. Now, if you said I didn't file because I didn't owe taxes, okay, just manually put the numbers in when you get the form. Um, and you can do that. You will be audited by the school to show everything you have. I'll tell you the story with one of my other children. I love picking on them. They had interest income dividends. They definitely did not owe any taxes. I had them fill out the, the tax return. Why? Because then I could just hit a button, upload, done. Didn't get called for an audit, I just upload. Whereas if I manually put it in, then you got to bring everything over to the school, the um, liaison for scholarships at the school, the financial aid office and show everything. I, I didn't need that headache. So it was a lot easier. Now, sometimes even in, when you do the upload, they might, you know, at random say, we want to see everything. But you minimize that if you can have something that you can upload. So yeah, manually put it in, but count, count on a visit to the financial aid office. All right. So we've got another one. My husband is 9-11 NYPD first responder and has a service-connected disability what documents does he need from NYPD to prove this to colleges? They have triplets that will be in college at the same time. That's an excellent question. You know, basically, uh, for any potential benefits that they're going to be showing and, and professional judgment, this would be a case not going to, obviously, the VA office, policeman you mentioned. You'd simply go in advance to the financial aid office. Now, here's the good news that a lot of people don't know. When you're doing your site visits to the colleges in your sophomore and junior year, many people are doing them already, um, or senior year, if that's the, the way, part of your site visit, you know, go on the tour, register you're on the tour so the school knows that you're, you're really interested in the school. But uh, see if you can slice out a little time to meet the financial aid office and explain the situation to and ask the school, what do they feel comfortable with? Especially if they're going to give you the equivalent of the Iraq Afghanistan grant, because if a death or a situation, this is would apply to some of our first responders that died, they have the equivalent of the Iraq Afghanistan grant. Uh, yeah. And so there could be some situations when you can get the max Pell, even if you don't qualify for any Pell or only a partial Pell uh, because of that. So on two fronts, the disabled as well as the deceased for our first responders, as you mentioned, I'd work with your new best friend, financial aid office of the school. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Will the FAFSA determine what scholarships are available from the college or do you have to apply for them on your own? You basically are going to inquire to the school. The school may have some. They pick up what the financial aid is, is on the college, and they know what they're able to. They'll they'll look for your SAT, SAT score, uh, and they'll look at your grades. However, we find that most schools in the current year, while they have some automatic things that they'll do, don't count on it. Manually go to the school and see what internal they, they have from their from their alumni associations and apply for them individually. 
Now, who's going to be the best one to guide you? Your new best friend, financial aid office at the school. But if you go to the website of the school, you will find that many of them say apply. Some are automatic. Good question. Um, does everyone that's eligible to receive the Iraq Afghanistan max pill uh, receive it, even if you make too much to qualify for the pill? Yes, and that's the beauty. So there are two variations, if I can call it that, although higher ed says, yeah, let me put it in English. The first one is if you apply for a partial Pell, anywhere from, you know, uh, above zero to the 7,800 and $84, somewhere in between. And you only get a partial. They'll bring you up to the top. So that's the first type of Pell Grant, the, uh, the first type of Iraq Afghanistan grant. The second type of Iraq Afghanistan grant is you don't qualify at all. Yet that also will just give you the max. So I have a family where the spouse remarried and um, remarried and the, the, the new husband, wonderful stepfather for the child, financially doing extremely well. So technically, this child's boxed out of the Pell. However, because of the Iraq Afghanistan grant, 7,385 has been awarded. So good question. Thank you. We had one and I answered it in the chat, but it's where do we refer back to the slides? We will be sending them out next week to everybody on this call, as well as we'll be uh, sending the recording. Um, we've got another do the siblings get any help? Well, if you go to, and the reason I did that one slide in this deck, um, in uh, I wanted you to be aware of a lot of scholarship programs that are out there. They're the same ones I used as a civilian for my own kids and what was brought up in previous Tuesday Children Conference calls. So take a peek at some of those. That one slide that had about seven unique sources. Also, if you're looking for some sibling scholarships that are available to military families, there's about five or six that are out there. Um, so I'd be happy offline to send that to you if you're interested. Be, be my pleasure. There's no secret sauce. I reveal whatever I have. And Candace, I can send that to you too if you want to share it either way. But we do Absolutely. have some sibling scholarships that are out there. Uh, they're competitive. Um, some are. They're looking at the cause of death. Some are um, your sibling. Your your loved one died in theater. Other is you died because of suicide. They're all over the board, but they are there. And we even Absolutely. have some scholarships for grandchildren, by the way. Send it my way because we do get those questions. And of course, you know, I always check in with you as well. Um, we've got multiples that are saying thank you. Very informative. Uh, one that asked what the VA education line number is again. Right. And that's different than the VA regular number, the VA educational number. They say it's so easy to remember, 888. GI Bill 1. Let me give it to you the way I remember it. 888-442-4551. And if you need help on the FAFSA, their customer service numbers right now, they're open till 7 Eastern. But again, you can't do the new one. But if you still have not done the old one for 2023-24, please do it. I saw a statistic that I almost didn't believe. And they said of people eligible for a potential partial Pell Grant in current thing, 40% didn't even bother applying. So if you didn't do it, please do me a favor, just apply. And I'll feel good about that. And again, you see my contact information on the slide deck that's before you um, on, on that. Um, don't hesitate to call me. I'm, I do my best to, to respond to questions. I care, been, do, been honored to be a survivor outreach financial counselor with the Department of Defense for 15 years and uh, been in the field for 45 years, and for 40 years, been a university teacher, uh, adjunct, adjuncting, and just, I really care for, for the students. And by students, I don't mean just the children. I mean the spouses. In fact, a special joy, and I think they're on the phone right now. We have a spouse that's on the line, going back to school, and is in the 70s. So it's kind of neat. I've been honored to do this with you. Thank you for allowing me the privilege uh, to the team at Tuesday's Children. Tuesday's Children has meant a lot for me uh, as a New Yorker, especially uh, being um, September 2011 in New York, uh, where my parents lived, where I lived. Um, very meaningful group. And uh, you're the real thing. I want to thank you for that.
Thank you so much, Mark. I think we've got one more that we might, or maybe two more that we might have missed. Uh, somebody asked, if the home is paid off, will that affect your income or financial status? No. No. Okay. Now, years ago, I'd say yes, because you're itemizing. But, you know, with the standard deduction, when you're filling out a tax return, you're not itemizing anymore. You know, this is part of the reason I tell people, if you can pay off your, your loans, you might as well. You're not itemizing. Um, most people take the standard deduction. So it, it's not going to really impact you. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of being debt free. And that's why uh, I, I invested this time putting this presentation together, because if you capitalize on all the scholarships, um, if a student can graduate, graduate income uh, loan free, it positions them for success going forward. And it also positions them if grad school is on the horizon, not to have debt to just jump into the grad school if they want to go there. Great opportunities that are before you. If I can help in any way, it means a lot. Give me that opportunity. And I know many of our community partners that we mentioned earlier would love to help as well. Absolutely. And there's one final one. Uh, does everyone who qualifies for the Fry Scholarship get it or is it based on academics? It's not based on academics. That's good. But I will tell you where you can mess yourself up is if you drop classes. Uh, so if you go to school and you take 16 credits and you drop a four credit course, you're still 12. You're, so you're good because Fry's giving you a housing stipend. If you're in New York, that housing stipend is like $4,000. If, you know, if you're in a, a smaller town, it could be 1000 and change. But what happens is if you now go under what's a full-time student, you owe back some of those funds. So my recommendation, if the times get tough and you have to drop a class, stay above 12. If you can't and you have to go under, take an incomplete if the school will allow you to do it. And then when huh, you can relax a little more, finish that up and pull out that class. You know, so stay a full time. And by the way, on the Pell Grant, we run into the same issues. So, you know, I'm not a fan of withdrawing when you lose your full time status. I'm a fan of asking the school if you can take an I incomplete and then wrap it up when time's better. Great questions from the audience. I'm looking at the names. Many of them I know. I, I call people that I've worked with for a while. It, some people uh, uh, that I actually spoke to even as early as today. So it, thank you for being on the call. That means a lot to me. And having 51 comments in the chat box uh, really shows that this is a, a, the right time and the right topic. Thank you, Tuesday's Children, for encouraging this series. Absolutely. And again, thank you, Mark. We absolutely appreciate everything you do. I've appreciated your knowledge for the last 11 years now. Um, again, I continue to learn something new from you every single time we talk. Uh, and I, I encourage everyone to contact him. He is the guru when it comes to everything college and financial. Thank you oh, so much that. for everything. And to the community partners that have helped me out, I want to say personally, thank you to that. Um, and we mentioned those. And uh, there was a reason why many have been mentioned. You have been resources for me as I try to be resources for the students and their families. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So Nikki just sent out a session three poll. Please take a second to fill it out. Um, and I do want to remind everybody that we will be sending out the slides for all three parts of this series, as well as the video recordings um, early next week. And we will also be sending out a, a survey. Please take the time to do it so that we know how to better assist you and when to bring certain um, resources and um, webinars to you. We want to know what you want to learn. So thank you again for everybody joining and uh, feel free to contact Mark if you have questions for scholarships or if you have questions, you're welcome to contact me as well at Tuesday's Children. My email is Candice, C-A-N-D-I-C-E at tuesdayschildren.org. Thank you everyone.